Welcome everybody to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette. We're so glad you're with us today to stay curious with a special guest, plant expert, how to grow food in space, Dr. Gary Studi. Welcome, Gary. Uh, thanks, Mark. Glad to be here again. Well, we're always glad to have you. Gary, you've been a friend of the museum and our executive director, Karen Conklin, for uh, probably a couple decades now. Uh, at they at least, at least. And uh, you run a little business that uh, mm -hmm. has made you, without a doubt, one of the world's experts on how to grow food in space. Um, how's that yep. going for you? Oh, it's going well. I mean, we're we there's uh, we've taken that opportunity to you know grow plants in space and apply those technologies for here on Earth. How you can use the the controlled environments, recycling the lights, those challenges of of space to put on Earth, and then the technologies of Earth. How we can implement into the really, you know, serious constraints that are required to give long-term sustainable growth on the moon or Mars. We're going to talk about some of those serious constraints mm -hmm. of growing food in space. And we want to offer your questions to Gary here. If you've got some questions about how we're going to feed 30 mm -hmm. people, the first settlers on Mars, yep. uh, uh, 30 or 50 million miles mm -hmm. away at the closest at, at closest. times. Uh, well, I'm always concerned about that. Uh, Marty Winkle is here to take your questions. Please, you got something on your mind? We'd love for Gary to answer them. Uh, I'm going to get through our little uh, advertisements here first before we take any questions. But uh, we really, what I'm curious about, Gary, uh, on this episode today, is is the sustainability of putting a dozen people on Mars on the first mm -hmm. uh, expeditions. And, uh, you know, how that logistics is going to work out to feed okay. them. In my mind, uh, feeding human beings is a problem that, that I don't see how it's going to be surmounted very easily. It's not going to have any easy solutions. There's going to be, a, you know, a number of questions and logistics that are going to change between the initial, you know, going to, to Mars, the establishment of early missions to establishing a self-sustaining, self-replicating colonies. So there's going to be an evolution of how that, that goes. And we can certainly discuss some of those challenges because that ultimately it is a fundamental requirement for life support <laughs> yeah. that we eat. We have got, you know, and we've mentioned it, mentioned this and uh, before, I just want to reiterate, we've got four things we have to do to stay alive. One, we have to have fresh air. We take in oxygen to stay alive. Every time we exhale, we're putting out a carbon dioxide that if it doesn't, isn't removed, will eventually suffocate us and we will die. We have to have water in order to keep going and food, the calories and energy. And, and the system can, is very good at producing oxygen, removing carbon dioxide or purifying water by physical or chemical means. To, at this point, the only way to produce food is biological. So we have a biological life support, a biological imperative to learn how to farm as we go to the moon and Mars, not only for food, but to sustain us in the other three requirements for life support. Well, it's something certainly fascinating. We're gonna take your questions here in a minute though, as we wanna get through some of the public relations of this, but a, a beautiful little postcard you brought there that you're gonna share with us yep. of the growing food in space there today. Tell your friends that they're gonna see a program like none other on YouTube and your participation helps support the American Space Museum. If you missed any of our programs this week, we had Terry White on Wednesday, Gene Wright on Thursday, both well-known influencers in the space community and there you are, looking so intelligent at that <laughs> test tube there. I know. <laughs> in there. Uh, it doesn't But you are intelligent. And we're going to have Mike Chachi Cianelli on Stay Curious for the First Time on Wednesday, March 20th. Boy, is this an acronym, Gary. He is the director of the Apollo Challenger Columbia Lessons Learned Program, mm. a very important chapter of NASA's history. And he is responsible for the uh, the Remembrance Exhibit, forever remembered mm. at the Kennedy Space Center uh, there that honors our Apollo 
I mean, our, our uh, challenger in Columbia Astronauts. Right. So we're looking forward to Chachi being part of our Excellent. State Curious I, family. I, I look forward to, to hear, hearing that episode. And, of course, we want to remind you in just three weeks is Shuttle Fest 3, where we're going to have a program more than just astronomy missions. J Astronaut J.D. Bartow mm. will be there. We're going to celebrate the life of the late Sir Sam Durant, yes. an, an astronomer. And who knows who will show up, but we can guarantee you there will be a launch director or two and maybe a surprise astronaut or two as we are still in our infancy of forming this important fundraiser for okay. our museum. And we think that by... Uh, it'll really get some attraction uh, by astronauts and the space community. And, and, and well, it should. You, you have, you, it, you know, Sam Durance was certainly a leader in his field and with his efforts down at, at FIT, educated a whole nother generation. Yes, for, he did. In, in uh, space. And uh, uh, astronaut Barto was one of my, very first, uh, he was at, at headquarters on one of my very first uh, flight experiments and was able to shuttle me through uh, some of the bureaucratic challenges that come with get, getting a, uh, a flight on orbit. So, and he helped you do that, huh? What was that? Uh, it, I, I had to get some um, collaborators on, on board and he was managing the the, uh -huh. the program. Yeah, great guy. He's, he's bopped into our museum a time or two. Mm -hmm. lives on the, on the coast here. Uh, astronaut John David Bartow. And uh, we'll definitely have a shuttle fest centered around plants in space. There's no doubt about uh, that. Uh, there, this is where it's happening if, for plants in space is here on the space coast. Good, good. Uh, and we want to uh, get excited about next Thursdays mm -hmm. on March 21st. We're going to celebrate the area code godfather for our west our space coast 321 is our area code ozzy osban was the person that petitioned for this in 19 late 90s and 1992 25 years later uh he's gone but his memory lives on passed away august uh, at age mm -hmm. 72 of natural causes and you certainly are familiar with the rocket hobo absolutely uh every launch here at uh they're they're at the river. He'd be out under the uh, under the flagpole, had had his speaker up, a loudspeaker transmitting what was was coming off on the countdown for the launch, answering any questions, and was absolute fixture that gave uh, a a a face to the rocket launches for the many visitors that come here to Absolutely. watch the launch. If you're from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and the only launch you ever see is out there at Space View Park mm -hmm. in your lifetime, you're going to remember that launch, and then you're going to remember this guy, old guy with a shock of white hair <laughs> that was out there uh, doing the countdown. He and, was doing the countdown. And, uh, uh, and then had to grab that tip jar as, uh, yep. as the rocket went up in there, saw hundreds of, of, of launches. He was out there at four in the morning or four in the afternoon. I was going to say it made no difference whether it was a dawn, dusk, midnight, or you know, pre-dawn launch. He was out there. Mm -hmm. And there's a t-shirt. Oh, uh, my dimension, we're going to have another noisy rocket launch about what is it mm -hmm. today? Six, fourteen, something like something that. Something like that. Marty will probably look it up. Bear want to say hi to Marty, who efforted these T-shirts we're going to sell for Ozzy. Twenty bucks if you want one. It's going to be thirty bucks. Ten dollars shipping. Put it in a if it fits in ship's envelope and get it out to you. Uh, 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 personal message me on Facebook or. Uh, uh, that's a good way to do it or if you want uh, put it in the one of the comments there and uh, we'll fit with your address or email or phone number we'll get back to you on that but marty had these done by old t-bone t-shirts down oh, there. there and uh uh, uh just in a couple of days so that, those will be a big hit uh, on there uh so that's the caricature of him that a uh outfit called rock paper simple put mm. together give them a shout out and uh, just for those of you who have been at Space U Park <clears> many <throat> times, like Gary and I, they're just about done with the footbridge between the yep. Mercury and Gemini <clears throat> monuments. This is a, a, amazing. No, I was out there just yesterday and had the crane was out. Could it? It's all. It's very close to being done. The railings are up, and uh, it it will be nice to be able to complete that walk uh, across the inlet 
over to um, the Apollo, from the Mercury over to the Gemini, and yeah. then back up through the Apollo and the uh, not and enough the people, Not enough people see the Gemini tribute there, which are pylons with bronzed handprints it's, of all of our Gemini astronaut heroes, from from Jim Lovell to Buzz Aldrin. Uh, Armstrong, Scott, all of them. I know, and, it, and it, this is a real neat, needed addition. So congratulations on getting that in place because it does look like when you come down, you're walking into some private residence, which it's not, but it now will open it up for yeah. a, a nice walk and a stroll for uh, and locals a, and visitors. And another great place to stand <clears throat> and watch a beautiful rocket launch yep. out there. And uh, with those beautiful condos in the background. The condos are where... Space View <clears throat> Park was supposed to go up the river, mm -hmm. and instead uh, someone sold the land out, and they did the dog leg there, yep. uh, in there. So, well, there you are doing mm -hmm. something that you do very frequently, and that is uh, speaking engagements around right. the world. Tell us a little bit about where you go um, and, and who's interested. Well, in that that share. one was in uh, was was in Panama. Uh huh. Uh, so so there I've had se several speaking engagements in in Panama been working with the group, the CPAC, it's a controlled environment agriculture center for, to take space technology and apply that to earth throughout Latin, Latin America. Uh, have been working with, uh, collaborating with our friends with the Michaelis uh, Institute for um, Global Studies and, they, and the KSC International Academy Next month, I will be going down to Brazil to speak at, at an education event and with, with teachers. Um, I will be out in, at, at or Oracle, Arizona, where the biosphere is, one of the first big efforts to set, set up a closed environment agriculture system here on Earth. We'll be out at a workshop discussing sustainability in a controlled in agriculture on earth. What's challenges, what's needed, what are priorities? So we're staying busy. Well, here you are being interviewed by German TV at the Artemis uh, mm -hmm. uh, One launch, uh, August uh, uh, two years ago. And that was a, I always say to people, though it was a scrub, boy, what an interesting night that was. And yeah. I'll never forget that night actually with the two German TV stations, three locals but, there. Uh, and the place is crowded with people in anticipation. It, it, wa it was it was an electric time. People were coming in like back back in the early shuttle days. There were lots of crowds, and it did did turn out. We did follow up with with that crew, and they went out to our laboratories, did some uh, inter interviews, and there's a a whole segment on the commercialization of of space that is uh, where we've got a feature in as well as many of the other. You know, people around. I think you may actually be be in in that that feature as, as well. Yeah, it's it's just uh, awesome the outreach that that Gary has done, but uh, uh, this is where we need to get, and uh, I don't think we're getting there fast enough. No, I and and am I, I right? What's just you and uh, I privately talk about this a lot. But... No, we're 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 not, and I I. I... I, you got uh, a special card there. You're showing. I've got a couple cards. That 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 card, which you've got at the backdrop, is actually a um, it is actually That's had so been a bubblegum trading card from the Mott's Trading Card Company in the 1950s. Oh, right. uh, probably 1957 or eight. They had two issues of it: one with the salmon colored back, and one with the blue colored back. And it, it was envisioning at that time what space would be like. And even then it was recognizing before we'd in, been to the moon at the early days of, of, uh, uh, of the space program that we were going to need to eat and be farming on, on space. Well, it says here, Gary, card 61, farming on the moon will be mostly done, quote, indoors under a large plastic dome. Carbon dioxide will be pumped in and sunlight will pour down on the plants. Special types of plants will be developed to give high energy foods to compensate for the pioneers' lack of meat. Today we'd say protein. Right. Uh, certain plants like strong cactus can that can withstand the blistering rays of the sun will be able to grow outdoors on the moon. What? 
Yeah, well, no one said <laughs> no one said that the bubble gum card was full of fat. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so this is like the internet, right? <laughs> that, that's right. Be, to, 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 to believe everything you read or everything you see. Well, that's and that's a cool backdrop there. No, it, uh, but, it, it uh, is. But the reason I like like this card and I'd like to show it is that the idea of growing plants in space and food in space is not a new one. It's been recognized as a, a critical requirement for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. And so there's lots of imaginations on how it does. Uh, there's some misunderstandings. The back of that's a, you know, a very good one that, you know, we're going to have a lot of sun and we'll have it in greenhouses. But in fact, uh, if you're growing in that case on the moon, there's a lot of sunlight, but this photo period, the day night cycle, if you will, is 12, you know, 14 days of light. 14 days of dark, 14 days of light, 14 days of dark when it's in the shadow of the moon. Yeah. So, so that's going to require, you know, different lighting systems. You've got radiation issues you've got to have protection from. Uh, there's structures that have got to withstand the, you know, the vacuum of space so you don't explode like a balloon. So there's a lot of challenges that go in with that environment that now have to be meshed with the biological requirements to produce the, you know, carbohydrates, the fats, the, the phytonutrients, the protein that are necessary for, uh, to survive and to thrive. Great. Uh, we're going to get into a little bit of that. I want to know more about like, you know, wheat, soybeans, corn, sugar beets, the, the stuff grown in, mm -hmm. in our, in our farm belt, you know, uh, is this, even feasible to do. To, uh, we need wheat to make bread and so many other products. Uh, but let's take a question from okay. from one of your running uh, partners there, Marty Winkle. You, All right. Did you used to run with We did. In, in, in... I used to try and catch up with Marty, so I can't say I ever ran with him. I ran behind him a lot. <laughs> well, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. That's right. And then, <laughs> and then at the end, he, he he was managing a lot of the races here, so I was trying to get to Marty because he was at the beginning and end cheering us all on. Yeah, yeah I don't think you were too far behind me, Gary. I wasn't that far behind. We're gaining. <laughs> then we got a question from uh, Steve Jokum. Uh, there has been previous experiments at KC about hydroponic gardening. Has this work ever provided any potential to help in this area? Um, the yeah, a, a, absolutely. So the the work on hydroponics here here at Kennedy Space Center, which I, I was very much involved with for uh, since since the early '90s, I would say has contributed to very much to development of the hydroponic and indoor agriculture industry, not only in the U.S. but around the world. I think there are probably three things that the the Kennedy Space Center and the scientists at, here at, with NASA can take credit for. One was demonstrating that how the yield potentials that came with growing uh, plants like soybean and, and wheat and rice and lettuce in a controlled environment with optimum conditions. It showed what was possible. The second they were demonstrating some of the new technologies of the effects of elevated uh, of elevated carbon dioxide, uh, optimum control systems, and ultimately the the desire to find lighting sources that were energy efficient and didn't break and that were safe that could be used on long term space missions has led to very early tests and support for light emitting diodes. And those three pieces, the potential, the environmental control, and the lighting systems are the enabling technologies that have allowed really the emergence of an indoor agriculture industry in the last 15 years. Thank so, you, Steve Jokums, for your question. He's up at uh, on the shores of Lake Michigan. Ah, very nice. There, and uh, uh, hopefully they're thawing out. Big winter storm in the Rockies, though we saw still winter in a lot of parts yeah. of our country. Let's look at some of where we've taken plants to space, eaten them even, and then mm -hmm. I'll have Gary address <clears throat> some of the the, uh, the the details of the uh, 
uh, pest okay. control. Uh, I'm even interested if cell structures of, of plants change in microgravity. But let's look at what has been accomplished. Uh, there you are in one of your labs. What you grow in there? Oh, that 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 was sweet. It's part part of my uh, very first spaceflight experiment. We called Pesto photosynthesis experiment for uh, in something. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was pesto. We had to get an acronym because we were, you know, we were growing wheat, and um, so that that was flown on during increment four of the space station, very very early for very early on in two thousand and one. Okay. And um, so we were in that experiment looking at the ability for those plants to to grow to germinate. Uh, purify water through transpiration, photosynthesize, remove CO2. And um, it was on orbit for 73 days on, this, on the space station. We had seven uh, harvests and, and plantings. We were able to demonstrate we could pre-plant, take partridges in and out as like uh, kind of like pre-planted seed packs. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, once we came back, uh, I was recently informed that it held the record as the longest plant experiment uh, until very recently when uh, uh, another team has been growing uh, hatch peppers on, on orbit. So it was a record I didn't know I had that recently got broken. Is this, was this plants that were in space or Those, Earth, those, uh, those uh, are plants that were on the ground controls. Okay. So those were ground controls. Um, uh, if they were in space, um, I would you know, be a happier man, looking man, because I had been able to be floating at the time. There's another, uh, well, I thought they were grown and then brought back to your lab. There no, space, no, so, right? but they very well. We Here's ended another one of your landed. colleagues. Uh, potatoes yes. play big in science fiction as feeding us, a a a.k.a. the Martian absolutely. blockbuster movie. Uh, potatoes have also been very prominent in, in you know, Na NASA's work at, with advanced life support. Uh, my co colleague on, on there, Dr. Ray, Ray Wheeler, worked with potatoes on his P PhD. He was involved in experiments growing small tubers uh, on the space station. Oh, at that time, they didn't have space station, on the shuttle. And in that, pro in that program there, in the biomass production chamber, that is the yields of one potato plant that was grown hydroponically under yeah, uh, elect electric lamps, high CO2, and you can see in the background the yields that we got. Uh, it was very promising because we were growing potatoes because they take a lot of the energy you put in, things we don't always think about here on Earth, or the light, the energy, the space volume is converted to something we can eat, mm -hmm. which, is, which is the potato and the very high in carbohydrates or people fuel. So it's very efficient at producing fuel. And so we we grew an awful lot of potatoes at an experiment that actually... What, what brand of potato? Everyone knows uh, there are different potatoes. Well, yeah, we were using a little red potatoes, New Orleans. We were reusing some little white potatoes. Uh, we needed to select for what we would call, uh, you know, short day potatoes. We could trigger them so you didn't have to have as much energy. They were very fast growing, so we needed early ripening varieties. Mm -hmm. And we needed those that had good cooking quality as well as storage quality. So there was a whole selection that went into cooking, storage, right? uh, uh, consumability, uh, yep. nutritious, uh, all, all the factors that you got to think about. Well, this is sort of a historic picture, is it not? Yeah, I think that is. Uh, well, I think will become a you know iconic picture. This was the you know the first lettuce that would actually grown specifically to be eaten on the space station, and that was in 2015. It was a unit that they called was the veggie, and it's it's very interesting because one of the challenges you don't think of. Look at that environment that you've got. It's very equipment dense it's packed with people it's very tight it it is an, an engineering marvel and a humanistic nightmare yet what we were able to do in that space is so there is a lighting system a watering system a nutrient delivery system that would allow the astronauts 
to grow the lettuce. They specifically were growing that as a, to demonstrate that in the actual environment that the astronauts are living and working, that that food could be produced. It becomes not separate, but a part of that environment. That's astronauts uh, Kimi Yua of JAXA and Jell Lindgren and Scott uh, Kelly yeah. on the right there of yep. NASA uh, uh, on an ISS mission. Uh, yes, you mentioned the human condition, human beings. I mean, right. when when you see a oh some sort of an info discovery science show that yep. tells you all the the little microbes that are on our skin and that we need to sustain us and mm -hmm. these these uh, monster looking things under an electron microscope that are in our nose and ears and all yep. that stuff. Yep. Uh, you're talking about these things in outer space, then may some way get contaminate or degrade plant life, right? Well, I think that, that NASA and I think space biologists in general have this sort of, sort of dichotomy going. One is we want to minimize any potential risk to the crew or the plants, the equipment that would be, be sent up. And there are microorganisms that can cause disease to plants or to people or to corrode equipment. So you try and minimize those by going, sending things up sterile. Unfortunately, it, within these systems, which, which works pretty well for things like satellites, but when you're sending up human beings, we are anything but sterile. And so efforts are made to minimize and exclude pathogens, take precautions to separate, uh, you know, the potential contaminants that would come like in growing plants from the crew and crews from the plants. So it becomes a, a challenge. And then much of where my thinking has come is that we live in a very microbial robust world. Our gut is full of microbes. The soil is full of microbes. The air is full of microbes. And so what you have there are a series of beneficials. And these beneficials, if you have enough of them, when the bad guy shows in, they just knock them out. So it's a matter of, and if you have a sterile condition and a bad guy gets in, they, they, they have nothing stopping them from taking something down. So there is now a real movement to start looking at what are the beneficials? How can you inoculate it? There's a lot of jargon around it, but mostly it is, let's, let's stock the place up with good guys to protect from the bad guys. Mm -hmm. Well, here's a couple more pictures of astronauts with <coughs> growing food in space there. Uh, and, and that's a real interesting, uh, you know, slide from, you know, 1997. That was kind of the, the first time I got involved. That was a uh, Ukra collaborative Ukrainian experiment. They were growing a little mustard. Hmm. And you see, it was just, it, they, you couldn't grow them very long. It was, you know, a plant research unit. And they got more complex in 98. That's on the mirror. Uh, Shannon, Shannon Lucid's Lucid, there, there. There was wheat. And then in 2003, they were growing soybeans. Peggy Whitson. Peggy Whitson. And then they were growing a uh, mizuna and then lettuce. And then now, uh, you know, most recently, chili peppers. And we've gone from under, trying to figure out can these plants grow, flower, and produce fruit to consistently growing, you know, fruits and leafy vegetables on orbit. So it's been learning that environment over a period of a couple of decades, the challenges that are unique to space flight and microgravity. Well, you gardeners that enjoy the backyard gardening, many of you are tilling up your land or getting ready to up in the Midwest as it's thawing out. Uh, Florida, as you pointed out to me the other day, mm. fl flora, the yep. flora, you know, uh, there are a lot of Florida. Yeah, a lot of plants and stuff around here. Um, what does it look like on the space station? A garden uh, pot, uh, and there is um, uh, uh, Kate Rubens is who yep. that is. Yeah, Kate Rubens, yep. and, and that is the um, I, I'm 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 looking in that. That's the advanced uh, plant plant habitat. That is the largest unit that's now on on the internet. That's so it. Place. It's like a, that's a, it. A giant microwave oven. Uh, no, no it's, it's more like your oven 
your convectional oven. Maybe. Yeah, it it's about the same size as a moderate sized um, microwave. Okay. I mean it's it, it's it's two it's two mid deck locker size. Uh huh. And that is the largest unit. So you know at the current state, so so we were watching an evolution from seventy nine now to two thousand and three, from you know very small units, you know, maybe three inches by 10 inches to use our imperial units to something let may, maybe a, a, a meter max. So we haven't got very far on using plants as advanced life support or sustainable system. We're at the point of learning that we can grow them, how they grow, and perhaps using it as a supplement to a diet, but not truly as part of a life support system. And the real challenge of what do we need to integrate to feed, as we mentioned earlier, the first four, 14 or 30, 40 people that are gonna be on an early mission to Mars. Well, Gary, 23 years of continuous occupancy of this International Space Station. Yeah. And the only place we've got to grow food is, is I can set it on this table. That is correct. It doesn't seem like we're progressing very far in this important nutritional need for humans there they are there are challenges and priorities where we all recognize that the need for food but at this particular point in time then the requirement to actually grow food to sustain astronauts on the space station doesn't exist uh if you think about it we you know we will see it see a launch uh you know, a little later, earlier last week, there was a crude launch. Within 24 hours, they were docked on the International Space Station. Mm -hmm. uh, so we can deliver food faster from Earth to the International Space Station than you can drive it across country from California to New York. So the, re so the imperative to have a, a large-scale food production system in low Earth orbit simply doesn't exist. And what foods are they grabbing first out of that cargo ship? Oh, well, they, they, <laughs> they, the first things they get out are what they're, they're bagged foods of, you know, dehydrated, ready to eat meals. But every mission comes with some fresh fruits and vegetables, or typically some fruit. So it has some, you know, peppers or, or apples and pears. And it, it appears the very first thing that astronauts do, much like, most of us to start playing with their food. They <laughs> they juggle it, they toss it, and they roll it around. But it's a very welcome change from the you know the uh, you know ready to to eat uh, food and thermally stable food that's yeah. on that's a, is the core of the diet. Julie Payette, Canadian astronaut, was just out the space center, and she was talking about eating with. Uh, there was fourteen. 13 men and her on the space station <laughs> and uh, but they would all eat together yes and she said if you saw food floating in front of your face you had to eat it because you didn't know where it was going to end up in the space station or if, if someone else would see it floating by so yeah uh, well you know that that's interesting because when the the pesto experiment that you saw before when it came back down to earth and we had the biomass production system which is the hardware we grew in. We took it all apart and looked at fans and we were wondering some anomalies of, you know, air and filters. What we were finding were dried pieces of cheese occasionally on those filters <laughs> because they would be pulled in and fil filtered out. So literally the environment that you're growing in is where things don't float, change, where things float change. It changes this lack of convective mixing. Mm -hmm. So water doesn't fall, fall down. Uh, gases don't go away. Pollen doesn't doesn't fall. Bubbles don't rise to the top. So that is the challenge of how you're going to get water, how you're going to pollinate, how you're going to to harvest. Uh, a candle flame looks like a ball of fire instead yeah. of a, a stick flame up there. Mm -hmm. uh, Marty, we have a question. We have a question from Mark Usiak. How many days does each food supply taken to the ISS usually last? And how many days of storage space is on the ISS? 
Ooh, that is a really good question that I don't have the answer to. Um, the, the, the specific answer to it's my, my understanding is that there are significant reserves for both to maintain food in case of issues on, on the ground where you can't get a launch or you cannot cannot get the, the resupply. Uh, much like when we were had, you know, when you know, unfortunate accidents with uh, with uh, Columbia. It was a long time before we could get back to to orbit. So there there are months, but I don't know the specific uh, answer to that question. It's a good question. Some I need to to look. We'll into. research into that, Mark yeah. Usiak. Uh, uh, our background here is a Mars settlement concept uh, from uh, mm -hmm. several decades ago. It looks like the Delta rocket right. there uh, that uh, was ahead of its time. Uh, is this what it's going to take uh, a, a vast uh, a warehouse to grow food yeah it's going to take a, a vast warehouse and despite uh, much of you know that the the beautiful pictures that come from using you know using the sun it will probably have to be underground uh, to protect from from radiation it will from you know cosmic radiation can be a real problem so you get some protection with the uh, underground on, on the regolith. It will give a little more temperature control, able to easier to control, uh, you know, both pressure and temperature inside. Our work with at the uh, biomass uh, pr production uh, chamber or the breadboard project was it's roughly, you know, size of, 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 uh, uh, of a bedroom, four, 40, meters squared of growing areas necessary to provide all of the calories that you would need day in and day out for one person. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's enough to produce enough water for five people and purify the oxygen and atmosphere for, for two. So it's a challenge of what you actually need and where you're going to get the priority between biological life support versus resupply. Well, here's some of the graphs that the input has to balance the output yep. when you're in a confined space. And, uh, you know, we've got 22 years of experience of, of freeze-dried food. We do. And, and uh, some foods that are uh, don't taste too bad and others that some of the astronauts, uh, uh, you know, question. But the you know, food's gotten a are. lot better. It's yeah. gotten a lot better over the past uh, 23 years. Marty so. and I were talking about that. Uh, we heard one astronaut say he actually gained weight in space, uh, but most uh, can't. We can't remember who said that. I'll have to look at some of my notes there. Yeah. But uh, we need what we need all these elements to stay. The what? the human beings. It's what two thousand calories. Uh, for a normal person, you'd have to think that an astronaut well, on the surface of Mars working. Pretty You're probably getting day. closer to 2,500 to, to 3,000 ca calories, 3,000 calories a day. Mm -hmm. um, you there is, you're, you're expending, you've got oxygen coming in, which we don't think about it, but has weight. And then we're expe expelling uh, carbon dioxide. We use water, not only what we drink, and but we need it for washing the food, prepping the food, washing and hygiene, which is limited, as I think you know, on, on the space station. But there's an awful lot of water that's being, being utilized. But as you take that in, everything that comes in comes out. And so, you know, th this bottle of water, if I'm on a mission to, you know, to, to Mars, I'm going to be drinking this glass bottle of water for the next three years. Yeah. As we know, the uh, yeah. the water in the International Space okay. Station is recycled urine, purified. Yep. They say better than that bottle of water. It absolutely is. So the water comes in, but it comes out not not only as you know as biological waste, but it will come out in in perspiration. It is then you get condensates, similarly carbon dioxide. Every breath in <sighs> results in a toxic gas, CO two out. Fresh food comes in, not so fresh food comes out. So if we're taking in, you know, you know, 30 kilos a day of food, water, and air, that's 30 kilos of waste that are coming out. 
Hmm. So that is where we start looking at sustainable life support. How do we recycle the carbon dioxide into oxygen? How do we take the dirty water, remove the nutrients and produce fresh water? And how do you take the waste, the waste and recreate that back into food? Another fascinating discussion with Dr. Gary Studi. He is one of the world-renowned space biologists, an expert in growing food in space. Uh, some of the nuts and bolts about it, Gary, as we look at a couple slides yep. here that you supplied us. Um, how does gravity affect cell structure? Um, is It will alter the size of the cells and the location of the cells and its makeup. So in the absence of in the absence of, of gravity, there's not that much need for support. So we seem to have things like in plants less lignin in it. Uh, there are changes in, in gene expression. There's some, um, you know, alterations in the form. But ultimately they, they, they look a lot alike. I was gonna say yeah, you were talking about the alterizations, but still romaine lettuce seems they, to look they, like romaine they, lettuce. They look a lot alike. So there's there are are two parts that, that go into any spaceflight experiment. One is what is this physiological changes that are occurring or what's happening inside the cell and the biology, what genes are changing, how does by uh, the lack of gravity or altered gravity or even that spaceflight environment alter how we respond. And then the other one, which I'm very much interested in, is what does that in, does it change the end result? Mm -hmm. Does it change? Do those changes? Does that plant have the word we use is plasticity, but the ability to adjust to that environment, so you can still make a Ramon lettuce or a soybean or a tomato that is fresh and nutritious in that environment that's so foreign to what it was developed in. And you want to grow things that you could use in different ways, chickpeas, making hummus out of it, things like that. Uh, of course, wheat we, would be the... Uh, so here, here's the challenge that we've come into. When I first started in this, we were looking for those, exactly that, wheat, uh, soybeans. Uh, we were, rice. Ri wheat, soybean, rice that were potatoes that are very versatile have can be used in a lot of different ways but what we as we time went on we began to realize that much of the energy those resources i put in in terms of the commitment of that 40 meters squared of that of the fertilizer that is taken up it takes like one and a half times your body weight in fertilizer to provide your food every every year hmm. So you've got to take that up, plus all the light energy that comes in, that if you have something like wheat, you throw most of that away. You take just the head of that wheat, yeah. then you've got to shape that, then you've got to process it down to a flour. You do some, and so you get a harvest index, roughly 15% of every, all my inputs I can eat. Uh, said otherwise, 85% of my effort it's got to be disposed of as waste. It's competing with it. Are you looking at ways to like make rope or other things? Absolutely, out of, out ways these, you can uh, redo those things. And the other challenge comes is okay. There's there there was an effort that Lockheed Martin and NASA were very much involved with called equivalent, yeah you know, yeah you know, equivalent mass. Okay, does it make more sense to spend the cost of packing up flour and sending it versus building the infrastructure to grow something that you're going to throw 85 cents a percent away right and where is that threshold to what do you take with you versus what do you grow and so in the shorter term the thinking has come where you take minimally processed foods things like lettuce things like tomatoes uh, different kinds of gr greens that you you grow them and 95% of your inputs you eat. They can provide the phytonutrients, the vitamins, and the minerals that keep you healthy. And then you supply the, the carbohydrates. So it, it's, you know, as we get further down and more established, we'll have to be growing much of our own material. 
But that is the challenge that then comes not only with the biological, but what are the mission constraints to what we can, can grow. We can grow a lot. A lot of things have been demonstrated. The next question is, what should we do, what should we grow under the constraints of a particular mission? Well, I think a lot of people uh, during the summertime enjoy having at least one or two tomato plants yes. out in the backyard. Uh, how do tomatoes stack up in space? They culture? tomatoes do do quite quite well. There have been a you know they've been grown on 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 the space space station now. There were a series of experiments that I was a part of for many years where we were looking at. Instead of the big vine tomatoes, little dwarf tomatoes that are very highly productive, these little cherry tomatoes, which are nutrient rich, they're very productive, and they can be grown in the constraints of volume and space and time that, that you have on orbit. Mm -hmm. And as a kind of an interesting aside on the various nations, including the U.S., have um, stations on the South Pole where they're testing. Food production, food production system, and those those places are growing generally the salads, and the environments are are such that they are, you know, that the crews look very forward to their annual Fridays with fresh salads, fresh foods, fresh those tastes and flavors. But not only that, beyond that. The sort of psychological input of you know there's sign up sheets for people to go hang out in the vestibule where the plants are because it has humidity you have the color you have the light so that psychosocial interaction that we have with our plants with our food with that community that is often unrecognized appears to be accentuated in these periods of isolation or that uh, very engineered and constructed environment that, that that will be the necessity for early missions to move to Mars. Uh, we talked a little bit about microbes in, in space. There's uh, uh, STS-135 and yep. two SpaceX Dragons apparently involved in this study. Well, that in there there had been a that there, I take my name for for the company Synergy from a series of three spaceflight experiments I had looking at plant microbe interactions and the role of, of, of space, you know, and lack of gravity. And the first one was on the final uh, mission of the shuttle program, STS-135. I was very honored to have an experiment on that. And the two subsequent ones have been on space, uh, SpaceX. Uh, uh, it was on four, four and eight. Right. And okay. what those were looking at, they're in, like uncrewed. We, uh, space those were uncrewed. There. Those were uncrewed, but those were then delivered to the International Space Station and done on a laboratory by a company NanoRacks. And you can see the small box uh -huh. there. There it was. That that was the the unit floating there. So we got a nice photo there looking at Earth in the back. But inside, there are a number of here on Earth a number of bacteria that are beneficial. Things that will produce can take nitrogen in the atmosphere, convert that to to fertilizer. Uh, those are nitrifying bacteria. There are others that are able to mine the soil and bring out other other nutrients. Other microbes provide protection and stimulation of plants to to grow. So what this experiment was to begin looking at: Can these beneficial plants find their host? Do they know that their friend or foe can do or they can they maintain themselves and do they get benefit on 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 in space? And then our goal as a as a company was to bring that to Earth and say, do these if they are beneficial, are they of enough benefit to improve the, the growth of plants here on Earth with these biostimulatory activities. Can we use this unique environment of space to challenge uh, organisms to become better at doing what they do than they do and bring them back to Earth? And so that's been much of our effort for the past several years uh, out in the Space Life Science Laboratory 
right there at the gate of Kennedy Space Center. Fascinating. Yes, you're there at Exploration Tower, mm -hmm. uh, wedged in there behind uh, one web and across the street from that Blue Origin complex. That well, I, I, th I, I think I would uh, rephrase that. We were there and has come out <laughs> around us, has been one web and the, but, yeah. and the uh, Blue Origins manufacturing <laughs> facility. You were there first, that's for we sure. We've been out there since 2002. Is that right? Yep. That, that's neat. You have seen that swamp transform into a, America's new space factory. That is absolutely true. Marty, a question for someone wanting to stay curious with Gary Studi today. Yeah, Mark Usiak is asking, have you been consulted by SpaceX for food issues with the new Starship and for future lunar and Mars missions? Um, no, I haven't. And, um, you know, I take this opportunity to in invite an inquiry because it's going to be a, a challenge. And, and one of the, um, you know, issues going forward is, you know, primarily, you know, you know and much of the, the key effort is the technology to get there. There's a lot of emphasis that, okay, we can, we, we got to build a rocket. We've got to get off Earth. I understand that as a first pri priority, a, a key mission. But further down, we have really got the beginning. You know, how are you going to, you know, feed a hundred people for three years? Uh, what are going to be those food requirements? Is it all going to be dehydrated food? Are we going to build a growing system? And with the uh, advancements in commercial space, the decrease in the cost to get to orbit, those equivalent mass equivalents, you know, what's it going to cost to get a kilo to orbit to make something? You know, is it going to, to build something to grow versus sending, you know, a kilo of food are changing rapidly. And I don't know if anybody's looking at that right now. I would certainly hope so. It's a question that's going to have to be answered. We have, uh, we have to take the soil with us or learn how to grow on uh, Martian regolith that they call it. How do you, how do you simulate what the, the soil is like on Mars um, without, we don't have a sample in our hands? We, we, we don't have, have samples in our hands, but we have an awful lot of analysis that have come from, from remote, remote of, you know, scans of the, you know, many years of exploration on Mars, as well as we do have, uh, you know, samples that appear to be meteorites that have been bounced and landed on Mars. So there's some composition that we 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 think there there's some we being geologists, and there's a group that is especially at the University of Central California has specialized in creating what they call simulants. So based upon those anal analysis, are building these these simulants that are matching. To the best of you know their knowledge, the chemical composition and the structure and size of what is on on Mars, mm -hmm. and so that those have you know evolved over the years, and as more knowledge is is gained, they get closer and closer. So we can do it, it's not the same, but we get as close as we can. Well, just imagine a real real uh, soil and dro uh, Martian soil well, and dropping a, a test tube of water in it to see how it reacts. Well, see how see how it reacts and if you if you've got that that reel it will be, probably be co covered right there with the, the that red covering on the surface of Mars. Rust basically. And that basically rust but it's a very toxic rust. It'll uh, kill everything. Aha. Uh -huh. Ah. But the good news is with that water treatment it's fairly easy to get off. So if uh, we have water which can be either found or, or generated, then we'll be able to do those tests. This is where I think the true test, here's a Mars habitat in Grand Fork, yeah. North Dakota. Mars is a very cold place. Yes. Uh, uh, it's not the kind of place to raise your kids in the famous Elton John song. <laughs> uh, We're going to be doing it anyway. Yes, uh, but uh, maybe that's a whole other area is, is biologically conception. Yeah. How does the... Uh, uh, that work in, uh, right. uh, in on, as a one third environment uh, gravity there on um, Mars, but Mars is cold. If they say it's forty degrees on Mars, that means at the surface, at the top of your head, 
it'd be below zero. That's how thin the Martian atmosphere. It doesn't yep. keep a blanket of warmth like the uh, Earth does. So these these type of inflatable habitats there that are growing food uh, are, I think, have got the right idea using a harsh environment uh, to start with to yeah. try to. And, and that that um, that that habitat that program at the uh, University of North Dakota is you know unique in that it is it's now one of the only ones here in, in the U.S. at an academic institution, and they will put in crews running from two weeks to a month of students to see how they're living and working in that closed environment. They're, they're, the laboratory there specializes in spacesuits, so there's ingress and egress, how you can get in, how you can get out. So that acts as a, a prototype testing laboratory for a, a, a lot of different technologies related to you know, e exploration. Mm -hmm. And we were, became involved with, with several of them over the years, but one project was you know, biologically, what do you do with all of, the, all of the waste that comes from growing some plants and you don't eat the roots or you don't eat the, you know, the, the little curled up leaves and of the, of the prepackaged foods you have, if you don't eat all of it, what do you do with that biological waste? And so that became an, an idea where you have the regolith or the Martian soil is, has a number of nutrients but they're not really available. They're, they haven't weathered. They're not freely accessible. So we began composting those with worms or vermiculture, in which, which case we would put that waste in, the biological waste, mix it in with this Martian simulant, and the worms will eat the waste. They'll pass it, eat the waste, pass it. But in the process, they're taking the the regolith in as well, and doing a biological weathering, releasing uh -huh. those nutrients. So we were able to then get demonstrate that if when growing the plants directly in the regolith, nothing would grow. We could get up to 25% regolith after some period of time of running them through that through the gut of the of the worms, where we can now grow plants. We're not as well as we'd like to be but it went from nothing to something. So once again, here's a biological way to use a resource, the, the soil on Earth, the soil on Mars, to release those nutrients, to reduce the amount of supply that is needed to achieve biological sustainability. So you think worms are going to be an important factor? I, of... I do. I did not. When I went into this, I was really, really skeptical. I was really, really skeptical. Okay, but you know, here here we go. I, I like the guys. We'll try this out. Surprisingly enough, it turns out that you know the the little worm eggs are incredibly stable. They can last for years. They can be frozen, and so they can be kept cold. The worm the, egg. Yeah, the, the worm the, eggs. The, okay. the 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 little worm casings. So those casings, you know, those well, eggs are, are are stable. They are resistant to high dose radiation huh. and you know given you know a proper temperature and water even after you know a, you know years or more of being stable will hatch out so so that makes them a possibility now to go hmm. be traveled not take a lot of space they don't take any life support to get there and then when you have an established system you release those in your food waste and then they can hatch, grow, and thrive. So you can build that population. So I won't say I'm completely uh, converted over, but they have a lot more possibilities than I would have thought. They're the hardiness of them. That's amazing. In it, it is absolutely uh, amazing. Of what kind of worm are we talking about? Uh, People these, would know the. These are red wigglers, fishing oh, really? worms. Good old fishing worms. Good old fishing worms, or uh. um, they, they are the most common one used in vermiculture or worm composting. System. Well, I'm enjoying this conversation with Gary Studi and leaving, learning a lot. Uh, we're not going to talk too much about the production here around the world as uh, uh, we've answered some good questions here. Uh, Gary, 
what is the overall landscape of where we're at? Do you think we are where we should be? Are we behind? Are we ahead of what you perceive as a timeline with, with uh, you know, Elon Musk really pushing the fact that he thinks, you know, by the end of 2030, there's going to be human beings living on Mars. Right. Um, I think we're way behind on the curve. I I think that I I, I know it, that at least here here in the U.S. for the past 25 years, there has not been a a test bed to systematically integrate these systems of biological life support, food production on a realistic scale for, for, for one person, much less four or 40. So without that uh, you know, ability to integrate testing, it, it's gonna be hard to see how we can just jump straight into that without doing what we're doing, just sending up, sending, sending up food. Because what, what we have, have learned through the entire space program is that as you go into this closure and you change that environment, there are unexpected results. And in a closed system, every system affects, affects an, another. So that integrated testing is absolutely critical. Uh, not saying that there hasn't been process, progress and that we have a much greater understanding of the effects of microgravity on how plants are growing, but this bioregenerative systems need to be become a focus. And uh, the NASA's latest or National Science, uh, National Academy's 10-year study has prioritized that as, as an effort that really should be looked at. So I am hopeful that that gets the funding and support and prioritization I personally think it deserves. Well, it sounds like it deserves a lot of attention, mm. food, and water, the essentials of life. Uh, and it's easy to get food up to the space station, like Gary said, and even the three-day trip to the moon. Mm. But when you're talking about nine months and you can only go the quickest to Mars every two years when it's close to Earth right. within 50 million miles. Most of the time it's 100 million miles away right. from us, uh, which is uh, 100 times further than the moon is. So uh, I've enjoyed learning some stuff from you here, Gary. I'm sure that yep. Doug Forrest has in Los Angeles. Dave Stangy's up in Michigan. Finn Aerospace. Oh. Any friends of yours? Finn I, Aerospace. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I think name. we should we I think we should become friends. Great. Steve Jokums. Uh, uh, Keith Sewell has been on Stay Curious. He's uh, enjoying his retirement traveling around. He's in Arkansas. Oh, that's where, my home state. Oh, is it? Where'd you grow up in Arkansas? Um, well, I was born in Oklahoma, but I called Fayetteville, Arkansas home. Fayetteville. All right. Uh, I think he's there for the total solar eclipse here coming up mm -hmm. in three weeks. Yep. Uh, Mark Usiak and Tom Usiak, our brother photographers in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Bill Whiting, great to see Bill today in the museum. And Carlton Bailey, our rocket photographer, living out there in Canaveral Groves uh, with all of his critters, enjoying another episode of Stay Curious today. Okay. Something you'd like us to share that uh, we haven't asked you? I've kind of put you on the spot about your opinions about that we're behind. No. Uh, what about other countries? Where do we stand uh, the big space faring companies of Russia, China, China. And Japan now, even India. In in um, the the uh, European European Space Agency has maintained a Melissa project uh, consistently uh, for for many years. So they they are you know moving forward on that. Uh, there was an Eden project that I had some engagement with with from the German Space Agency that was on you know, looking at use, integrating these technologies to support the Neuhauser station down in the South Pole. Very successful uh, uh, project. They're growing food in the South Pole? They were growing food in the South Pole in something the size of a shipping container. Okay. I mean, it, it, it was a shipping container. Yeah. That was outfitted with, you know, the, the technologies you know, that uh, to, to grow, grow, grow plants and test them. And so that overwintered, I think, two winters. And then there is the Chinese 
have had a, a very expansive program of, of controlled environment agriculture, growing lots of plants, keeping crews in of four. They've been in integrating small animals uh, for protein. So, you know, my opinion, we're behind at this point. Well, we need to catch up. It is people like Gary Studi that are trying to do that. Mm -hmm. Is this a good career for people to go into? Oh, at this point, it's an absolutely wonderful career to go in, into. The space business is, is, is booming, to, to use a pun. But the interest in exploration, you know, in, in the past, you know, we, we've had the biggest rocket on the planet launched from here, what, two years ago? Just, you know, they're in the process from Texas, even bigger rockets going across the planet, capabilities for exploration. There are, I think at this point, 14 different satellites or ground-based surfaces on the moon doing our, our recognizance. You know, we're doing, we're doing the homework, we're doing, you know, the due diligence, we're building the technology to go. And as we go, those questions of how we're going to stay alive are going to need food. That's going to be more than just farming food. It's going to be understanding the nutrition, the constraints of space. And it is a, a career that I think is incredibly interesting, but also has huge, huge implications here on Earth. We're in the next 30 years, we're going to have another 3 billion people on the planet. That's the population of North America, South America, Europe, Japan, and Australia. They're all coming to dinner. And they're <laughs> moving in, 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 in the cities. The agriculture land is getting depleted. Mm. Water is getting challenged. So our ability to feed these 3 billion people, we're setting the table now. And so we're the application of this technology for very efficient, sustainable, high yield, high return production that's necessary to go to Mars is absolutely critical to be applied across the globe. And we will be watching that progress here on Stay Curious as we see, uh, keep in touch mm -hmm. with Gary to see some of the innovations coming on there and and I uh, wish Gary good luck. Uh, he needs uh, grants from companies and so forth to do your yeah. research. Uh, and this is one of the most important areas that I think is being neglected in our space program. Gary, thank you for sharing you that for being with us today. Always, always a pleasure to be here well, you're and always support great. the museum. Yeah, it is. It well, is a very. This is a museum that you know. Yeah, we're just down the road from the Kennedy Space Center. But this is the, the museum that, you know, truly celebrates the, the work and the workers that go into creating the, those missions. And so, you know, anybody that's in this area, take the short ride up to Titusville and come visit this museum. Uh, we had astronaut Don Thomas pop in here yesterday morning mm -hmm. when it, it opened up. Uh, he actually paid to come in. Uh, the young man at the front desk had no clue who he was. Don Thomas flown yep. in space four times, uh, and Ohio not. And yep. yes, we're, we we feel what we have here is all about the space workers celebrating the birth of America's space age right here in its delivery room, Brevard County. So, Marty, I'm going to forego the last slides there and uh, ask you if we've got anything to button up for a terrific week of guests that we had. I will show one more slide here. These are the guests we had this week, Terry White, Gene Wright, and, of course, our good friend, Dr. Gary Studi here. Uh, you can catch those rerun shows on YouTube. And, of course, we're going to celebrate 3 2, one day for uh, Ozzy Osban next Thursday. So, Marty, anything else going on? Nope, we're good, Mark. Well, it's date night, Friday night to go out and get some <laughs> good food somewhere, right, as we're talking about food. so. Yep. Uh, let's get out of here and watch another noisy rocket launch Sounds like a plan. about 10 miles from here. So once again, we're thanking Dr. Gary Studi and each and every one of you who watches Stay Curious on a constant basis. We do appreciate that. I know Gary Gerald's watching. He's our Vidalia onion farmer. Ah. And when I'm cajoling him to bring him and his wife, Donnie, a, a 
a crate. When he does, I'll be calling you up and sharing it. With oh, I, I, I love those Vidalia onions. All right. Well, Marty, thanks for all that you do. We've had about 1,005 or six episodes here of Stay Curious, and we're glad that you've been with us for a lot of them. Until next time, I'm Mark Marquette saying I can't wait to see you in our museum to bridge the space between us. <laughs>